words about the community. Uh, this community is for entrepreneurs who, who wants to go global and uh, wants to have the power of network help them to move their business uh, globally. Uh, basically, the role of the uh, community of uh, participants is to help each other and uh, participate in our events and basically uh, uh, be uh, helpful with uh, every other members. Uh, our past events, uh, we had amazing speakers uh, uh, like Bob Dorf, uh, Mikita Mikado, uh, Bill Reichert, uh, uh, he's, no, he's a known venture, capital, uh, venture capitalist, I Ilyas Tribulayev, Medina Islam, uh, and uh, most of those uh, people are from Silicon Valley, they are successful as entrepreneurs or venture capital investors. Um, our upcoming events, uh, um, the fund, uh, the U.S. Uh, fund, uh, um, Unventures agreed to have a webinar with us tomorrow, so make sure to register. It's going to be a very interesting conversation about how due diligence has changed uh, after COVID. And uh, it's important because many funds don't invest and some funds invest aggressively and you need to know how to win the hearts and minds of those investors. Um, also, uh, I'm announcing a new initiative, a live pitch to global investors. A lot of American uh, funds and uh, angels have confirmed to participate, and it's going to be on uh, uh, June 22nd. And uh, you can register as a participant to, uh, to watch it, or you can register as a startup to pitch, and I'm selecting five of the best startups for this uh, pitch. And um, or you can join as an investor if you invest in startups and looking for like uh, the best ones. Uh, another uh, great speaker we're going to have in a couple of days uh, on June 24th, uh, Steve Hoffman will join us and he will talk about 10 com commandments of raising venture capital in Silicon Valley and, and very important in, in China as well. So he knows a, a venture capital ecosystem. Uh, not only in Silicon Valley, but in China, and use this opportunity, it's very rare. And it all, as you know, all our events free to help you entrepreneurs to move your business forward. Uh, also, we will have uh, our monthly events uh, with the community, founders, uh, the one in English will be uh, early July, uh, so you can uh, join it. And uh, the one in Russian will be at the end of uh, June. Uh, so if you want to join any of our events, you can scan this QR code and you'll see all the events I was just talking about and uh, having uh, access to the, the new ones. Uh, our partners, uh, Roosbase, IB Consultant, Skolko, Technopark, GSD Venture Studios, and uh, the Moscow School of Management, Skolko. Um, so how to join? You just uh, can find us on Facebook, Go Global World. Uh, you find your group of your country and join your local community. And uh, this is an example of local community that is connected to our Go Global World uh, ecosystem. Uh, we also are on Telegram, uh, as if you're in Russia, Go Global Russia. Um, we also on LinkedIn, a YouTube channel, and etc. And this video will also, will also be on YouTube channel. Don't, uh, don't forget to like it and repost it to your uh, social media. Basically, that's it. Um, I'm going to uh, present Derek. Uh, Derek Distinfield uh, will be moderating today's talk. And um, I just, if you, I want to say a few words about Derek. Uh, he is uh, a successful entrepreneur. He start, started a couple of uh, uh, companies. Uh, he ran uh, his own marketing firm and he knows how to build communities. He also uh, uh, was uh, on the management team of um, payment 360 they took it from zero to two billion dollar company and uh, he also ran uh, um, a national accelerator incubator incubator for um, uh, and he, where, where he actually helped hundreds of startups to uh, uh, raise capital and get to market so this guy has tremendous expertise in starting companies and uh, scaling them um, Derek, I'm giving you the word. Please present Donna, and uh, you guys uh, can lead this session right now. Thank you. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm the co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, but I'm an entrepreneur first and foremost. I've been that since I was seven years old, and the one thing I've learned is second to money, time is the most valuable thing that you have. 
um, as an entrepreneur. So I appreciate you taking some time to spend with us. I appreciate Donna taking some time to spend with us. I think we spend a lot of time focusing on what a pitch is and what it's for. And oftentimes we revert to it's about attracting investor dollars, but I think a pitch is about aligning your company with a mission, aligning your team with a vision and values. I think it's about attracting customers, certainly attracting in investors, but having that pitch that you can rock is vital to the success of all aspects of your business, not just investment. I think one of the hardest things to understand about a pitch is that nobody gives a shit what you do, they care how you can help them. Nobody gives a shit what you can do, they care how you can help them. I think the challenge when you're armed with that information is determining the best way to plant the seed to explain how you can help them. And as entrepreneurs, we believe if the customer or the investor just had all the information that we had in our brains, they would surely invest and surely buy. But you have to plant that seed in a certain way. And I think how you plant that seed is important, but also it's not so much always what you say, it's how you say it. And I do think there is a certain language that you need. And I can't think of anyone that grasps these concepts better than Donna. I've worked with her on several companies, uh, multiple projects, and it's not just me. Um, I don't know how many millions of dollars her clients have raised, um, but it is a lot because everybody in the Valley works with Donna. And so, she is an expert in communication. She doesn't need much more of an introduction than that. So thank you so much. And Donna's gonna take it away and teach you to rock the pitch. Wow, <laughs> what an intro. Thank you, Derek. And um, thanks for your support always. And it's about half a billion. That's how much uh, my clients have raised all in all. Um, so I hope to add a few more million to that list with some of you here. Um, so welcome. You know, I was just thinking yesterday um, how much I miss speeches with interaction where I can see the people and I can see the smiles and I can see people laughing at my jokes. So I'll just imagine you all cracking up over the jokes I'll be telling over the next couple hours. But um, I, I definitely agree with Derek uh, and I'll say it in a little bit more genteel way. Um, nobody really cares about what you do unless you can show them why they should care what's in it for them, um, whether it's your customers, whether it's your investors, or whether it's anyone except maybe your parents. And, you know, they kind of are invested. So um, let me tell you a little story uh, to start out. 2008, I'm having a bit of deja vu uh, in the past three months uh, to that time. Um, I don't know how many of you were around. By the way, I want to say any of you that have questions, concerns, please feel free to write it in the chat. Every few minutes, I'll be stopping and Derek or Danil, you can feel free to write in Russian. They'll translate for me and I'll answer the question. So I want this to be interactive. Okay, so 2008, um, I was still working, um, teaching and training presentation and business writing skills in Fortune 500 organizations all over the world. I was traveling everywhere. I was in Russia. Guess where? Nizhny Novogorod. Mm. Yes, the fun capital of Russia, right? <laughs> so um, I, I, so I, I taught there and I, I really got to, to go all over. And then all of a sudden, boom, in a matter of a couple of weeks, everything shut down. Travel, nobody was paying for travel, presentation skills were no longer essential. Um, so I found myself at a crossroads and I'm like, well, what now? I've never held a job. I've always worked for myself and, you know, trained and gone places and uh, uh, what happened? Now at those crossroads, very similar to where we are now, those can be very scary times because of suddenly you see the storm here we we just feel like we're in this stormy wa water everything's changed in an instant everything we thought we knew we don't know anymore but at those moments if we look for the beacon 
when we look for the light, suddenly new opportunities find us. And my opportunity found me um, with a heart surgeon who somebody introduced me to, and he needed help with his professional speeches, but he also was a tech entrepreneur. He had created two medical devices, and he said, can you help me create my investor pitches? I've been invited to an angel conference to present both of my things. I have five minutes to do each. Now, I'd never worked with a startup before. We're talking, this is like 2009-ish. And I said, but you know what? A story is a story. Might as well. So I, I worked with him on his pitches. I actually went with him and presented on his behalf. I don't usually do that, but he was, you know, a wonderful person, not a very good presenter. And he, he was there to answer the questions. And when I saw the other companies get up to present, my heart broke because before they even were able to start saying what they did, they were shot down, bing, bang, bang. Like Derek said, nobody cared because they weren't prepared enough to speak to a room full of 80 something angel investors. And I thought to myself, here they have this opportunity. They've traveled far and wide to meet 80 something angel investors in New York City and they didn't find someone like me to, to, to work with them on it. And I started looking and I said, I found that there weren't very many people working on storytelling for startups back then. And I said, okay, that's my new audience. And what do you think the voices around me said? Uh, startups, uh, no one's going to pay for your services. They don't have any money. They don't think they need you. I said, okay. So little by little, I started to build up my business. I offered um, to work with accelerators and competitions to help prepare the pitches as a sponsor. At first, people were like, sponsor? If you want to sponsor, just give us money. But then when they started seeing how much the pitches improved, it became a good deal. And time went by and I've been very, very lucky to do what I love um, and do what I'm good at and work with people all over the world with fascinating stories. And now fast forward to now, here we are, um, I can't even say in a post pandemic because we're still in the midst of it um, and we're very uncertain times. So one thing that I know is that when you go into the unknown, you never know what you're going to find. And let's keep it positive because there's a lot of opportunities. So when it comes to investments, um, when this whole thing first started, uh, I read an article in TechCrunch that was basically talking about that this is a really good time for investors to invest. So it's not that investments are not being made, but people are being much more careful, careful about the investments they make. And you need to be able to tell a story with your pitch that shows them why you are the ones they should be putting their money on in these times, why this is a timely opportunity, why this is so important now. So in the last recession, out of 2008 to 2010, these were companies that were success stories. Lego managed to triple their business because they decided to expand into Asia. And they came out of the recession. Well, not that we ever really came out of that recession, but they came out doing very well. Groupon was born during that recession. Um, the world, I mean, I grew up in the States, so everybody used coupons, um, but not a lot of people in the world knew about it, but suddenly here we were in a, in a economic downturn, people loved it. Um, Airbnb, the whole shared economy was born in 2010. They had about seven major rejection letters that they put out to show people that when they were raising half a million dollars at a valuation of one and a half mil, um, people were just saying, yeah, thanks, but no thanks, we don't see it. So look at, you know, <laughs> where that went. I, I, they've had their struggles, but I don't, I think they'll bounce back, I think now more than ever. Amazon went from just being a bookstore. Um, they released Kindle then and then started on their journey to capture everything. And Netflix, which I don't know if you all, um, if anyone remembers what Netflix was doing at first, uh, but they were competing with what was Blockbuster then, which was a place to rent videos, videotapes or, or DVDs. And Netflix would send you a DVD home. You, you would put what you wanted to watch. And then you'd send it back and you'd get your next choice. <laughs> so people thought they were crazy. They were competing with Blockbuster, but look at where they are now and look at how they pivoted. So it's very inspiring to look at these companies and others and see how can we transform ourselves into these opportunities 
because of what's going on, not in spite of. I think it's because is a much better um, approach. So I wanna give you a really good toolkit to build your investor presentation and um, how to speak to investors. And a lot of the things you're gonna to see today have come straight from the mouth of uh, Silicon Valley venture partners uh, from very respected firms. Um, so your message counts now more than ever. You really have to stand out. You really have to show how you are different. You always have to show differentiation, but today it just becomes more crucial. So speaking of Lego, um, I'm gonna teach you um, my Lego set today. Now, but beforehand, I always ask people when I'm actually in the room with them, in this, you know, in this day and age where we have tablets and, and uh, Fortnite and I don't know what else kids are playing with it, how can it be that something like Lego is still one of the most popular toys anywhere in the world? And the answer is that Lego is the creative expression where structure meets flexibility. Doesn't sound like a real thing, but think about it. We can build whatever we want with Legos. There's Lego cities, Lego land, Lego buildings, but you have to stick to the structure. Stack, 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 stack. You can't start to build and break. And by the way, sets that we have today will still fit with sets from the 1950s. They've kept it um, that way. But what this means is that even a very small child can learn to build with Lego. But as they grow older, they get more creative. Um, so that's what I want your messages to be. There's a very specific structure, a very specific Lego set that if I give it to you today and you use it, you can start to get as creative as you want with your content, but sticking to the structure simply works. And Derek knows we've worked on several decks for several of his companies that he works with. And each time I give him hell because if it's not in the structure, we have to put it in the structure. So let me save you the time and the effort of figuring that out. And let's find the Lego structure. Let me just see, we have some things in chat. Uh, yes, we have the QA. So Danielle just put the link to the QA in the chat and you'll be able to um, ask questions there. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to take all of your information and I want you to chunk it into four parts. And I, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you what those four parts should be but I want you to understand why we chunk information, why we gather information and bring it together. Um, when we went to school as kids, and if you have kids, you know it, I have a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I see the way they take in information and how fast they learn. Our brains are like little sponges. It's, it's never ending what we can take in. Who's tried to learn something new in the past few years? Yeah, so what happens is our hard drive is very full, our operating system is like Windows 19 or DOS even. Um, and the, you know, the problem is as adults, we've kind of learned everything and we know everything. So it's not like we're starting from a blank slate like this. We can argue and say, I disagree. And that kind of argument prevents us from learning. So there's a principle of learning for adults called the principle of chunking. So it's plus, five plus two or minus two, meaning like three to seven chunks of information are the optimal for our adult, tired, crowded brain. I say stick with four, it's a good place in the middle, three works too, but I wanna show you how. So let me give you an example. If I were to start it off today and said, hi everyone, today we're gonna to be talking about fresh fruit. Um, we'll talk about lemons, mangoes, cherries, raspberries, apples, pears, peach plums, um, uh, carambola and uh, star fruit. How many fruit do you remember from that list? <laughs> maybe star fruit, maybe the last one, maybe your favorite one, but I don't even remember the list that I gave. But if I were to say, hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about fresh fruit. We'll start off with citrus fruit, which includes lemons, oranges, and grapefruit. Then we'll move on to tropical fruit, which includes mangoes, coconut, and bananas. And finally, we'll end with tree fruit, apples, pears, and peaches. A little bit easier to remember. Yes, because we chunked the fruit. And then 
that's what our brain does all day long. We get a piece of information, hmm, oh, file it away. Piece of information, file it away. Our brain is always looking for what is it that we, uh, that we already can match that with. But all of a sudden, something new comes in and it's like, uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem. I don't recognize that. Shutting down in five, four, three, two. So either we shut down and we turn off, which is the flight, or we fight. We start to argue. No, 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 no. That's not the way. So if you're going to be talking to people, and let me tell you, investors have heard so many presentations that they're used to hearing in a certain way. And if you don't do it in a certain way, they don't quite know what to do with themselves. And then they do start to argue. Stick to a structure that works. And this is a structure that's thousands of years old. I mean, we're talking Greek tragedies. We're talking Shakespeare, Chekhov, Moliere, all the greats. They wrote in chunks. So we're going to do the same. So um, let me show you what the four chunks of an investor pitch outline look like. Now, you may know this and you may be like, well, she's not teaching me anything new. And that's great that you know that. The question is, does your presentation look like this? So we want to start off with the need, the challenge, the problem. Remember, Derek said nobody gives a bleep about what you're doing unless you could show them why. So you need to show the need for what you're doing in the world. And now let's just add to that, especially in our new normal. Your proposed solution where you'll show the product overview, the demo, um, your simple solution statement. We'll talk a little bit more about these going forward. The business side of things, the current status, your ad, your traction, your market opportunity, your business model, competitive landscape, your vision for the future, what will be your milestones, additional products, your funding requirements. Um, and then finally, I like to end with a slide called key investment merits or why us, why now? So these four chunks, what they basically are doing are answering all the questions that the investors have in mind. So what you want to do is when, within each of these sections, think of all the questions and we'll talk about the questions that they ask later, but those need to be addressed in this flow. And if you think about this, this goes right back to classic writing, classic plays, classic tragedies, same structure. And we'll look at that later. So there are three things. And by the way, um, Danielle, Derek, any questions in the meantime that came up that I can answer? I'll just take a little pause. No, it's very interesting. Everybody is following you. And uh, uh, I ask everyone to ask questions in the Q&A section. And uh, we will be uh, uh, asking Donna uh, uh, during, uh, during her talk. But uh, after she finishes her talk, we'll have a full Q&A. We'll definitely have some time for, for Q&A. We might even have some time for a few little pitchbacks. So if you're thinking of your pitch and wanting to practice it later, be listening to this and then you can pitch me and I will pitch you back. I'll, I'll improve your pitch on the spot. So, so if you want to do that, you can also put your name in the Q&A or in the chat and, and Danielle and Derek will take note of that. Okay, so there are three things that investors are listening for while they're listening to your pitch. Credibility, likability, and momentum. How well, credibility, how well do you know your stuff? Is your team someone that knows how to execute? Uh, likability, are you someone that's coachable? Are you someone that's, that's easy to work with? And by the way, I've talked to investors that have, have said that they see so many great pitches that they have to look for the teeny beeny itsy bitsy things like even if they see a, a a founder like look at their phone in the middle of a meeting that's it that's a no so they want to know that you're going to be someone that's fun to work with that, that's that's engageable that's someone that they can talk to and momentum how far along are you so these are three things that we want each and every slide to speak to at least one of them and the likability of course you will be at your best the whole time so first thing you want to do is you want to introduce yourself. You want to say what your team is, I mean, what your startup is, and um, you know maybe a little bit about it. We'll talk about these things uh, in a minute, the traction and the accolades, and how important it is to start with those if you have them. But unless your team looks like this, there's really no reason to start with the team. Of course, if the team is in the room, you can introduce them. But if you're all, you know, you just uh, came out of a MBA program or, or this is your first thing, 
I don't want you to spend too much on the team, especially if you have like a five minute pitch window, you can always come back to that later. Do start with the team if it adds to your credibility. If there's somebody there that's, in, that's a serial entrepreneur that's done this many times before, if this is um, uh, a team that um, has a very respected advisory board member, if there's somebody with a special field of expertise, then definitely put them up front. So if you have significant traction, if you have um, revenue, if you have great engagement, if you have amazing signups, don't wait for the good news. Put it at the beginning. Okay, investors, I've seen this happen in sessions where uh, a startup will pitch and like on slide 17, suddenly they'll get to their traction and they've closed deals with big companies and, 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 and investors are like, why would you wait to tell us that? Because when they hear it, it opens their listening and they're much more engaged. So create the brag slide. Don't call it a brag slide. That's a key word between us um, that, that wouldn't look very good. But put, and this I would do in your sales deck too. But in a, you, know, you don't have to put all the little numbers in the metric, but sales, growth, month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year, uh, engagement, stickiness, major partnerships, if you have IP or, or regulatory process that you are, you're progressing on, amazing testimonials from, from someone that counts, and we'll talk more about testimonials later because it's so important. So anything to grab their attention, they will be listening in a different way. If you haven't made much traction yet, you can wait to do current status a little bit later. But if you do have significant things, go for it. So the more um, you can have numbers to back up what you've done, the more of a believer they'll be. I've seen VCs be like very against an industry and then suddenly they see numbers and they're like, oh, wow, can't argue with that. So if you're in multiple industries, if you have growth, if you have numbers, that's great to put in. Now, another thing I want you to start with, and this is all before the first chunk of the problem, so introducing yourself, um, if, you, if your team adds in the brag slide, I want you to have your vision statement or your North Star, as they call it in Silicon Valley. So Simon Sinek, and if you've never seen any of his talks, I would highly recommend watching them because he's great. Um, but he talks about the why. So he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So if we look at the three different layers, the why is your mission or your vision or your belief or what it is five years from now that you will have completely transformed in this industry. So have your vision. It really makes a difference. And then you'll be able to kind of show that as a through note throughout the entire presentation. Then later we'll get to the what it is that you do and the how you're doing it. Those are important too, but you must start with the why. Now, just to look at a few companies' whys, their vision statements, um, I find these very inspiring. And also, what's interesting is they're not talking about the, what they're doing, like LinkedIn, to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. That kind of touches on the what, but it's beyond that. Um, Facebook, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Into it, I, I, I was really surprised by theirs because I never thought of them as a very inspirational company, but to improve its customers' financial lives so profoundly, they couldn't imagine going back to the old way. So that is stickiness, that is addiction. And if you can show that your customers are so addicted to what you do, that they would never consider leaving you, that's something that investors love too. So find your why. Um, pause for a second and ask if there's any questions. Um, yeah, so yeah, a very quick question about sharing the recording and I have an answer. Yes, there will be a, a, it will be on the um, YouTube page of the community. So we will share it with you for sure. Great, okay. So if there's any questions about what I'm saying, if I'm going too fast, please feel free to slow me down. Um, okay, so then we start to move into the first actual chunk, our first act, the problem. All of that was kind of like the, the, the opening of the act. So now we're in the theater, the problem. Now there's two different ways to show the problem. Either make them feel the pain, and that's the stick, or make them see the light, that's the carrot. 
So either make them, uh, you know, understand that there's a problem in the world, there's a danger in the world, there's something that could impact them badly, and hey, you're here to solve that, or ah, hallelujah, there's something great that can happen, and you won't believe this, and we're about to tell you how you can get into that. So some people are more attracted to protecting themselves, and some people are more attracted to getting good things. You just have to see which your audience would, would be more um, impacted by. But then you want to take that problem or that carrot, that exciting thing, and turn it into a story. So within the framework of the storytelling, we're also going to be adding stories in because our, our brains are much more likely to listen to stories. So Mark Twain, a uh, famous American writer, said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So I agree with that, but I, I'm not saying lie or make something up. What I am saying is your stories don't have to be 100% exactly according to the chronology that they happen. So your story, your problem story could either be the way as a founder, your founder story, how you came up with this, maybe something affected you personally or someone that you love. It could be um, something that affected the world at large, like a big um, security breach. It can be a quote, it can be a number, it can be anything that, that makes people start to realize the size of this problem. Um, another, I mean, just, just to kind of show you an example, I was working with a, a team a few years back and I was having a hard time understanding what it was that they were doing. And they kept talking about computer vision and image slicing and, uh, and deep learning and machine learning. And I still didn't get what it was they were doing. And then one of the founders said, you know, one time when we were in Tokyo and I said, oh, you came up with the idea in Tokyo? And they're like, no, we just told you. It's blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, be quiet. Y'all came up with the idea in Tokyo. And they kind of looked at me funny. And then I think they got it and they started to smile. Because doesn't it sound sexier to say something like, we were roaming the streets of Tokyo, feeling lost in translation, looking at these beautiful buildings, having no idea what we were looking at, not a single sign in English, um, no one to ask. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could just take my phone, snap a picture of a building and know right away what it was that I was looking at? And then we thought, well, why couldn't we do that? And, and fast forward um, a few, several years later, they're actually doing it now with VR and AR and in your car windows. So you, when you drive in a city, you can see different things happening. It's very cool. But I mean, do you think that the investors looked at their passport to see when the stamp was to Tokyo? Mm -mm. So you can take the liberty with that and saying you came up with the idea because it's, it's about resonating. I think we've all been in a country where we didn't read the language. My goodness, when I was in Russia, it was, I, 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 couldn't, I could see the signs. They looked kind of like letters that I knew, but it wasn't. So we know that experience of feeling that we're missing out on something. And that was the sentiment of the story. So go for what really hits people in the heart, the gut, and then the mind. Because our brains are hardwired for stories from the time we were a little kid. This is my, um, my seven-year-old when she was two. She would like gather stacks of books around her and pretend like she was reading. Today, she reads chapter books like crazy. Um, and her little sister does the same thing. Now, pretend she's reading and she could just look at this. We are wired at a very young age to do this. And yet we forget after a while um, some of this and, and how important it is and what an impact it can actually make on us. Um, and kids can listen to stories again and again and again, even if it's the same story, just because they're used to doing it that way. Now, stories connect between people. Whenever we hear a story, we will automatically say, oh yeah, that reminds me of the time that, because there's a part of our brain called the insula, that will always look for connections. That's the same thing we talked about the chunking at the beginning. We're looking for ways to organize our information. But the minute somebody is hearing a story that they resonate with, they identify, they're nodding, they're agreeing, and then something magical happens between our brains. And our brains actually synchronize. And that's a great moment to influence. So by telling these stories and by getting people to identify and resonate, even if it's not about them, but it's getting them to see the world of your audience, then you're getting somewhere. Yes, Danielle, was there a question? I, I thought I heard you clear your throat. Uh, no question. Oh, okay. Okay, so 
you want to think of the problem that you're solving like the villain in a movie. So there's always going to be the, the Dr. Evil, but there's going to be a lot of mini-me's. You want to go for the Dr. Evil. Now, this is a list of problems that startups have traditionally worked on over the past, you know, probably since 2008. I'm going to have to update this list because we have a lot of shifts in the villains in our lives that we're trying to solve. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but that economy, 2008, the recession gave life to the shared economy, Airbnb, Uber, any of these security vulnerabilities, cyber, um, waste in the system. We have a lot of sustainability plays going. Now, the last three, boredom, popularizing cultural trend, and missing a great opportunity, these are more um, the carrots. These are the more, you know, it's not like we're solving uh, brain cancer, but at the same time, there's a big market. Boredom, I mean, kids are playing Fortnite like crazy, and uh, companies like King, who made Candy Crush, are acquired for $5 billion because people are bored. <laughs> Missing a great opportunity, I call that the many on the floor. Those are those things that it's like, how did someone not think about that yet? So these are all of the things that we really um, want to look for our main problem. Always go for the bigger one. You may be solving just a chunk of that, but always discuss the bigger one. And yeah, so questions is, uh, before we move on, yes. So uh, Slava Gusev is asking, um, question. Hello, hello, Donna. I know there is a, a, there are at least two types of pitch decks. The first type is a pitch deck which is sent to the investor on the mail and uh, there is the most important is this, uh, 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 the second. Uh, the first type is to, uh, the pitch deck which is sent to the investor on the mail and there is uh, there is the most important is described very concisely. Uh, and there is a second type of uh, the pitch deck, uh, which is already shown in details to the investor. Mm -hmm. Is it true about two types? And if yeah. so, what types uh, are, are you talking about? Okay, so the structure goes for any type, okay? It also goes for the elevator pitch. Problem, solution, business, and, and moving forward. It'll just be a condensed version. It's like taking a big image and, and just sh um, resizing it. To, to fit. So you need to still have the problem solution. Now the send out deck, what, usually what I write my decks for clients will create a deck that is the full deck that you would present, but I put a right balance of text versus images on the slide so that could be a standalone. And then you don't have to send the whole deck out. You pick like the eight, 10 most compelling slides for your, what we call teaser deck. Okay, so definitely, and we'll talk about how much stuff usually goes on slides and how bad that is, but, but definitely you should have two types, but it's the same story. It's just the condensed version. Teaser deck means tease them, make them want to hear more, not tell them the whole story. Thank you, excellent question. If there are more of those, please put them in the Q&A. So now we move from act one to act two from the problem opportunity to the solution. How are you going to solve it? And this is where you write probably the most challenging sentence you've ever written, your simple solution statement, which is anything but simple. This is the we do X for Y by Z. So you want your sentence to be that simple, nothing like what's on that board there. It has to resonate with anyone, whether they have a degree in computer science or cryptography or not. Um, and once you've got your, your simple solution statement as fast as possible, you wanna to move to an impressive demo. Um, Steve Jobs could have stood there for an hour talking about the iPad, but the minute he showed it, we got it. Our brains, the biggest part of our brain is devoted to visual processing. And we need to see to believe, that's the kind of creatures that we are. So show them use the demo to take them on a user journey. You can show through the demo, it's not just showing off your product, but it's showing through it how much you truly understand your customer, how much you truly understand their needs and how you're going to solve it in a beautiful, simple, elegant solution. So one of the things I like to do is to show a user story. 
So what you can do is actually for your opening story, your problem story, if you already have a client that's had like a big transformation um, and it's a big name, start off in the problem telling us about the before, life before you, you didn't exist. Okay, and what were their problems and what were they not able to solve? And you can even bring a quote from them. And then you can broaden that and say, this is an industry-wide problem. It's $8 billion a year are wasted on blah, blah, blah. And then later you come back to the demo and you say, now let's look back at company A and see what their journey was like using our product. So the before was their struggle before. Then you wanna show, okay, they onboarded, the implementation, uh, the different steps, you can show off a few features in there. And then talk about results in just six months. We saw cost reduction of 35%. We saw 72% more enrollments. We saw, you know, and show the numbers, the KPIs. And then if you have a testimonial saying how much they love you, how they can't believe this has happened, go for it. And then you can have one or two shorter use cases from different parts of the industry that, that, that highlight this as well. That's also a good way to go. And just stick to the killer features. Don't show them every single aspect. This can be done through screenshots, mock-ups. Um, you can do a screen flow capture of it. Doing a live demo can be risky, especially when we're presenting remotely now and there's all kinds of delays. So you wanna have something prepared ahead of time, okay? So write out that little user story. And then you can say, I'm happy to show you the system live now, now that you get it. Now, if you do have testimonials, let your clients be your champion. Then they're not gonna give you a testimonial. You have to ask for it. So if there's somebody that loves you and can't get over how much they love you, say, great, would you mind if I got that in writing? Or could I use that in my investor presentation or on our website? Normally people will say yes. Some people are limited in uh, like big companies and they, legally they're not supposed to. So you can just an anonymize it. Like I used to do a lot of work for Intel, but we were never allowed to use Intel on, um, on our slide. So I would just say a large company who is inside your PC. So, you, you know, have a little fun with that. But let them talk for you. Any questions, Danielle, before the next one? Not yet. Okay, please feel free to ask. So I know y'all aren't falling asleep. Um, okay, so in case you didn't have the brag slide, now we're starting to move. We had act one, the problem, act two, the solution, act three, we're moving into the business now. Okay, if you didn't have a brag slide at the beginning, if you're still early on your way, this is a great place to pause and show your current status or your traction, how far along you are. Is the product in alpha, beta? Have you had a POC? Um, do you have any early revenue, um, partnerships, IP? Anything that you're starting to work on, let them know where you are. Show any momentum that you can. And then the, th the main things I want you to show in the business are differentiation. What truly sets you apart? Now, um, I hope I don't have to say this, but it's very important to never say anything bad about our competitors, especially in Silicon Valley. If you say something negative about someone, that's a bad signal because they're thinking, hmm, I wonder what they're gonna say about me behind my back. So your, it, your competitors are doing great things, you're just doing great things plus plus. So you wanna find your true differentiation statement. What truly sets us apart is, and then how do we wanna show our competition? There's a few different ways to show it. This, eh, bad. All right, investors hate this. I don't understand at first glance what I'm looking at. I have to look and, and try to figure it out and read too much, not a good one. So try to avoid this. I did work with someone yesterday where I have to say, we really tried a bunch of different ways that this was gonna work best, but then we limited it to six characteristics very simple and clear cut. Um, the two by two. Well, some investors say they hate it. Some investors say they love it, but I've seen them not have these and be like, well, why isn't it for there? Or somebody will like move themselves to the bottom left and, and they get confused. So this is one of Airbnb's early ones. You just wanna make sure that the X and the Y are very clear, simple, and, and sophisticated. So you're not just, you know, saying better. That's not a differentiation. 
Uh, now, one that investors like, but it's a bit more complicated to show, is what's called a market scape. So it's showing the different players and the contenders and where you, as opposed to them, and where will you be, and how will you get there. And I don't mind you being showing hubris, as the quote says below. So that's a good one to go with. This is just also a very simple way that they said they like, you know, just show you in the middle and show your different logos around you. And there can be different logo types of different competitor types. And then you can just talk about them. And finally, this is my favorite. Um, this is the panel diagram. This is Steve Blank uh, from Berkeley. He's a um, professor and he's an expert on entrepreneurship. And this is if you are like in the middle of a bunch of different solutions and you solve a bunch of different things, this is a great one to show that. So Slack competed when they came out with a bunch of different things, collaboration tools, file sharing tools, communication, task management, business communication, and they really are all that. So that was a great way to show what they were doing. They were touching on many. Yes, Janelle, was there a question? Yes, there is a question. Uh, Stanislav Sergeyev is asking what uh, sh uh, we should do if we are at the very beginning and uh, have no ground for uh, bargaining. Okay, so that will that might be a good question to ask Derek also um, because I'm not exactly sure how it goes in Russia. But here, if you don't at least have an MVP or a prototype. Um, and, and some kind of basic functionality, it might be too early to be raising. You want to get as far as you possibly can on your own blood, sweat, and tears. You want to show them how far you've come. You want to show them. Um, I mean, there might be accelerators and uh, venture houses and things that see an idea and want to invest in you to help you bring that idea to reality. And I do think that that's what, what, uh, what GSD does. Um, so it's okay to not have everything just it's it's harder to raise funding so try to get as far as you can get loans get you know work on your own work the night through Derek do you want to add anything to that are you with us yeah no I, I think you're absolutely right I mean if you, if you don't have anything I mean it depends what slides you're talking about but I think the I think he meant like the traction slide um the like how far we've come if we're at a very beginning and early stage um and and we don't really have that then how do we show it yeah i mean keep in mind that investors want to invest their money as if it's pouring gasoline on fire so <laughs> they are only going to invest in something where they see traction and they see traction happening fast mm -hmm. so you have to find a way to get traction or data that shows that traction is coming. So maybe it's going to get um, surveys or there is some data that you have that if I give you a dollar, you're gonna turn it into 10 very, very quickly. And you have to show some kind of momentum or evidence that's happening for that statement to be true. Or to Donna's point, you just aren't ready to fundraise and you need to keep priming um, so once I give you money, it's like gasoline and you're going to blow up. Uh, in yeah. your opinion, guys, uh, letter of intent uh, with the potential customer will be uh, considered as a evidence of traction. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. If it's a signed letter of intent, somebody's ready to put money in, that's great. That's definitely a traction point. I have three more questions. Uh, do you want me to read this one right Please now? Please do, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, before I read them, uh, guys, use this opportunity to uh, pitch uh, uh, your solution to Donna because this is a rare opportunity. She's connected from Silicon Valley. She's an expert in this and she will give you feedback. So I'd encourage you doing this. Uh, and uh, since our community is free, it's, please use this opportunity. I'll be happy to see if it is one does the speech. So Maxim Gologilev is asking, what is the difference uh, in the pitch in pre-seed and ra round A? What should you focus on at each stage? Okay, so the structure is gonna be the same. Um, 
whereas in seed you're pr you're putting your thesis out there as to what you think is going to work and what kpis key performance indicators you think you'll be able to reach in a you've got to show how well did you do with those do you have product market fit meaning are people willing to pay for your service so by a you should have shown that you've achieved product market fit you already have revenues you have people um signing up coming on and getting further so you want to real that's where you put the you want to show all the achievements you make even show and, and usually in round you'll also be pitching to your in existing investors so you can actually show them where you've matched up to the kpis that you said you would achieve in the however long the 18 month runway that you had so it's met backing it up with a lot more and then it's not just go to market it's expansion and growth because you should already be in the market now it's how are you going to grow yourself into it so those are the two main things but the structure is the same you know what the structure is the same i work with vcs on their venture decks on raising from lps the structure is the same there. They just have a, a, a bit of a different, like, you know, the problem or the, 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 the thesis that they're solving, how they're doing it, what's unique about them, the business side of it. It's pretty much the same. It's just there's a few changes within it. The overriding structure, same. Thank Other you. Other question. I agree with you. Uh, um, Vyacheslav Gusev is asking, I heard that in the presentation, it is very important to describe your secret sauce. What could mm -hmm. it be? How to find it? I'm making a website, taking, uh, uh, talking with potential customers, adding features. What could be my secret sauce? <laughs> so your secret sauce um, is your unfair advantage. It could be someone on your team that has in-depth experience. It could be that you have IP, you, you, you've got something proprietary that you can patent. It could be something that you've hit on that no one else has hit on. Um, it's got to show, you know, something that you have that others don't. Now, you don't always have a secret sauce, but you want to, if you do, something unique. They want to see things that haven't been done before, haven't been tried before, new technologies, things that make them go, oh, wow, that's different. That's, that's truly unique. So that's what you want to be looking for within yourself. Thank you. Uh, Kivalu asking, hey Donna, should the com should competitive analysis be always objective based on uh, researches and etc., or can it be a bit more subjective so we can tell our story and em uh, emphasize uh, our key message? So, if I understood the question correctly, um, look, there are obvious competitors. There's direct competitors, there's indirect competitors, and you have to be able to address them. Otherwise, that kills your credibility. If you haven't brought up someone who's either a big player like a Microsoft or a big venture-backed um, play, like here it would be, let's say, uh, Blue Jeans or a Trello, um, then you've got a problem. So you need to be able to address all these, you know, to know everything inside and out. And then you can also tell the story of why, what sets us apart, what truly differentiates us. So I hope that addressed it. If not, you can just write a clarification of your question. That's it. Thank you so much, Donna. Okay. We'll come back to more questions. Keep them coming, guys. These are awesome questions. So as I said, we never want to diss our competition. It breaks the trust right away. We don't ever want to be in that position. Um, the, set, the other important part that we want to talk about in our business is monetization. How are you making money or how will you be making money once you start? You want to have at least one main revenue model and then you might have additional revenue streams that, that are on that. Now, they know that this could change, but you need to show that you've thought about this. And the third and probably the most important thing is the opportunization. Now, that's not a real word, but it rhymes with monetization and differentiation. So if you remember the three Asians, then you're in good shape. This is beyond just how big your market is, which you need to know what your market size is. This is the silver bullet of the why us, why now? So investors uh, suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. Nobody wants to feel that they were the one that said no to Airbnb. Um, so you need to show them why if they don't invest now, they will be kicking themselves five years from now. 
and you need to show the trends and the opportunities that are happening that make you a very attractive investment opportunity. So in thinking about our times right now, um, I'm seeing some trends, like just thinking about the last three months since we've been in shelter in place, um, of, of how many things have popped up that were lacking. So remote work and collaboration, like look at what happened to Zoom overnight. I always have used Zoom for, for years, but man, their growth was like 167% in the first week. So, um, but there's a lot of griping about Zoom and then there's Microsoft Teams and that's lacking. And so, so there is a lot of room for remote work and collaboration. Slack still owns that, but at the same time, there, that's a space that needs to improve. And we can see the need because more and more people are gonna be working remotely. Money savings app, we're, we're once again going into a recession. So Group Auto merged the hero last time. Um, my husband's working on what I hope will be the new Groupon <laughs> and will uh, uh, emerge the new way for to help people save on things they love to do. Um, logistics delivery. Suddenly, China, which was manufacturing everything and shipping out, big problem there. Suddenly, things were shut down. Suddenly, supply chain. I don't know about Russia, but in the U.S., we had a shortage of toilet paper. Can you believe it? But what the reason that happened was think about it people weren't at home all day they were at office they were at school and and what do the the, the the toilet paper rolls look like in a in an office they're like this big you can't use that at home you don't have those dispensers so suddenly the demand rose but what's crazy is that these were not things that were forecast so logistics delivery last mile is going to be big digital health who wants to go to a doctor's office now? So yes, we have video docs and all these different things, but that's another thing that's gonna have to transform a lot. And Edutech. I have two little ones. Uh, one just went back to preschool the other day, hallelujah. Um, and my other, she's going to be in second grade next year and she's been learning remotely from home. There's a lot of space for improvement on that and it doesn't seem like Kids are going to be fully going back to school. We don't quite know what it's going to look like. So Edutech has a big opportunity. So these are just five areas that I've identified. There's more. So I want you to think your, so your solution, how can it also serve the post-COVID new reality? How are you going to be able to jump on that bandwagon? And I worked with a company a couple of weeks ago. They were working on a way to... Um, for home diagnosis of uh, listening to your heart, like from home. So if you had this device, you can put it on a kid and it transmitted the, the data to a doctor. But by measuring the, the sound waves, they actually found that they can better diagnose COVID. So they immediately filed and got a grant for 100K to start doing the research into that and show how they can, without non-invasively, start to identify this much earlier before the damage is done because it has a sound to it, apparently. Interesting stuff. So how can you jump on this? Why is your time now? Yeah, do you think uh, uh, having a post-COVID slide, uh, a post-COVID strategy slide is a, uh, a smart thing to do right now? Absolutely. Now, you don't necessarily want to write post-COVID. You don't want to put COVID, COVID, COVID over everything. However, when you get to this trends and opportunities, and this might be something that you address when you talk about the problem. If it's super connected, don't wait for it. I was working with a company yesterday that has an HR solution for benchmarking compensation and benefits. So she actually started running her pilot right when Corona hit, and it's the demand has grown massively. Why? People are moving. Their, their benefits packets, like who needs to go to the gym now? Um, their salaries are still Silicon Valley size and they might have moved somewhere else. So there's a whole new thing of being able to benchmark what companies are paying, what the right compensation to attract talent. So we did put a slide in that said, and now suddenly today's reality has completely changed and shuffled the card. So definitely, but if you didn't put it at the beginning, so when I talk about the opportunization, 
the, the trends and opportunities, I usually like to do three trends. The first one will be something about a movement in the market, mm -hmm. a trend that's happening. So that could be COVID or that could be something else. It could be a Gartner study. The second one I like to deal with is usually around regulatory issues, legislative issues, laws changing, information security changing. And the third one that I like to do is usually about um, major investments or acquisitions of, of uh, uh, competitors of yours, because it's a great signal to show investors. Yeah, we have three more questions, uh, if you may. Uh, okay. Vyacheslav uh, Gusev is asking, is it important to have a slide with the unit economics? Such uh, uh, a slide is very difficult to do at the pre-seed stage. Yeah, yeah. at the pre-seed stage, it's, it's nearly impossible. So, I mean, you can have a financial spreadsheet for like the next three years, but it's basically like, you know, licking your finger, holding it up to the wind and saying, oh yeah, it's gonna rain next week. So I, I wouldn't worry so much about a unit economic and a seed slide. I would worry more about the business model and projected revenues if you start to get clients. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, and why this question came up, I think uh, because in Russia, uh, most of the investors will ask this question anyway, uh, mm -hmm. like even at the pre-seed stage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's uh, uh, it's very common question for like the guys uh, even at MVP stage. Um, so how would you? Um, so if they wanted, have something about it, um, and then. Uh, uh, but the, the, I mean, it really is like kind of like why uh, mm -hmm. at this point. But if if it's something that's that's just try as best as you can to make it as detailed as possible. Right. Yeah, um, so the other question, Vasily uh, Vitalievich, uh, uh, pitch and teaser is short uh, docs uh, with major information. Further in investors require business plan evaluation, feasibility, study, aud audit, financial modeling with much more precision info. So it's not like a question, like a statement. You know, what's your opinion on that? So again, uh, you try to get your financials as crisp as you can possibly get them. Um, it's harder in earlier stages. Uh, next question. Maxim Gogolev, how to show a fear of missing out uh, just about trends uh, or is there, is there another way? Like I said, trends, M&A um, or major investments in competitors, uh, legislation, regulatory changes, anything that can prove your urgency. Okay. All right, back to us. If you didn't show your team at the beginning, this is a good team, time to show it in the business and focus on their assets. Why are they the ones to execute and get this off the ground? Um, future directions, get them even more excited than they are. Additional markets, features, products. This is a great place to link to the vision. So if you started off with your why, now you can say, but this product is just the first step. We intend to do blah, 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 blah. And then you, you just make it even, even bigger and more excited and more lucrative. Then the ask slide. Be specific. How much are you asking for? Not between five and $10 million. Don't do that. Ask for what you're asking for. And don't ask for five million in your seed stage because that's kind of a ridiculous ask, even in Silicon Valley terms, because you need to be able to show something for it. So, so start with something that will give you enough money to not run out in six months, but not so much that it feels overinflated. And what are you asking for it for? Usually it's like product development or enhancement, team expansion, sales and marketing, IP regulatory activities, and then put your round objection, object, objection, objective. This will take us to 18 months, 24 months, and KPIs, KPIs, KPIs. Where will you be? Now let's talk about KPIs for a minute. You can look forward 18 months from now. Where do you think you'll be in terms of revenue, in terms of pilots, users, the markets you'll be in, and then work backwards to show your milestones of how you will get there. All right? Look forward, work backwards, be very clear where you think you'll be. Because uh, investors, when they're writing a check now, they're not just thinking about this round. They know they're on the hook to invest in you in the next round unless they only invest in seed rounds. If they don't invest in you next round, that's a very troubling signal to other investors. Why should they? So always make clear what you can achieve in the next 18 months. So 
just looking at this again, the investor pitch outline, we had the need, the solution, the business, the vision for the future, and the key investment merits, which is kind of like a summary of, of everything that we did. Uh, questions before we move on to a few last things and then hear from some of you. No, 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 no more questions at the moment. Okay. Has anybody volunteered yet to, to pitch? Not yet, and I'm looking forward. And you oh, <laughs> okay. Um, Derek, you might have to start us off with one of the companies that uh, you're pitching with, um, but we'll, we'll do that in a little while. Um, so in the meantime, everyone think what you would like to, to work on. A few more things. Slides are a reflection of your product. They have to look great. Now, I put at the bottom here a bunch of different tools you can do with yourself, Canva, Slide Bean, Slide Body Maze, Haiku Deck. It's, it's either free or very affordable to do it yourself. Or if you can, invest in a, in a designer or if you have a UI UX person, let them work the magic on your slides. They have to look as great as your product. You wouldn't believe how much it matters to investors. It does. They might say it doesn't. It does. <sighs> Ever seen a presentation that made you want to commit suicide? Bullets upon bullets upon bullets. It's, it's unbearable. And you have to wonder why people do this. Well, they do it because they think that they're not going to remember everything that has to be said and you won't get it. So what do they do? They shove everything on the slide and then they end up looking like they don't know what they're talking about because they read it off. So the rule of thumb is one big idea per slide. Please let go of the, we have to do it all in 10 slides. I don't like that. I don't know why he said that. I disagree with him completely on that because what happens is people try to fit in like, it looks like eye charts in 10 slides. I'd rather you have it more spread out. Usually when I work on a typical deck, it's between 15 and 17 slides, depending on the size of the demo that might broaden it a bit more. But the main problem here is, we compete with our own words because we take in information through three channels, our visual, our auditory, and our kinesthetic. And when we read, the same part of our brain is activated as when we listen. It's not the visual part, it's the auditory part because we're decoding the language. So if you have a bunch of words up there, guess what? They're reading and they're not listening to you unless you're reading off every single word, which you shouldn't be doing anyway. So minimize it. And whoever asked in the beginning about the send out deck, you, you can have more language on the send out deck and less when you're presenting more visuals. Um, and just to piggyback on that, it should be one big idea that Babushka can understand. <laughs> so um, in the words of Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Um, there's a story behind this, I'll skip it in the interest of time, uh, but how we came to, to be, but the bottom line is, it's all about them. It's about your audience, not just Babushka, it's, it's, it's anyone. Nobody wants to feel dumb. So you need to elevate them and, and make your message super clear. All right, people wanna buy from people that make them feel smart. People wanna invest in people that make them feel smart. And I've seen investors turn to, uh, to, to, to founders that they didn't get what they were doing, saying, can you explain that to me in a layperson term? And it's embarrassing. Your questions, this is very important. Um, Q&A is a very crucial piece of an investor pitch. And they might not just wait till the end, they'll be asking you questions all the way through. First of all, if they're asking questions, that's a great sign, that means they're interested. If they're not asking anything, you might get a little worried. Um, and you wanna be ready with answers. So your presentation should contain a lot of the answers. But if you wanna prepare yourself, if you go, um, I have on my website under resources on donagriffith.com, uh, there's, the, there's also like a summary of a, the cheat sheet for, for the investor deck, which kind of summarizes what we talked about. But um, the ultimate guide to investor questions, I've put together like over a hundred questions that they will ask. So choose the questions you think you might be asked, you know you will be asked, that you dread being asked, and find answers for them. And practice those as well. Especially if you're the CEO and you need to be answer, able to answer tech questions. Especially if you're the CTO and you might have to answer business questions. You should all be able to pitch. Yes, Danielle, questions. I see there were a bunch that popped up there. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, amazing presentation. I'm not sure if you uh, finished, but it's just really great. A couple more slides, but thank yeah, you. Very structured, I really love it. Uh, Slava Gusev asked another question. Uh, Donna, thanks a lot for your great helpful answers. I have one more special specific questions. I am developing a website for an organization uh, for organizing effective networking at online events. I don't know how to evaluate my market. Can you help me please with uh, this problem? Not my realm of expertise. I would ask Derek how they evaluate the markets. I'm not a financial market data. I usually take the data people bring me and spin it into a story. I think so he talked about uh, making customer development or this. Uh, yeah, market. to be able, you need to be able to have somebody that does the market research to be able to do that. You you can do go as far as you can just with Google, and Gartner, and if if you are affiliated with the university, you could probably access Gartner and such market research for free. But you need someone that knows how to do that. Yes, yeah, sorry. You would start with the problem and then try to determine how large the problem is and then move backwards that way. But it sounds to me that you're building this without identifying the problem first. So I would pause, focus on the problem you're solving, and then determine how many people in the world have that problem and then put together a hypothesis around your financial pricing model. Um, most typically would be like a software as a service and you could come up with how big your market is. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Great next piece of question. advice. Thank you. Yeah, next question. Eva Lou is asking, when pitching to a US uh, VC, does the market traction in emerging market count? And if not, uh, any hints uh, and tricks uh, to bridge the gap? <laughs> Mm, excellent question. So the basic answer is, um, if you're planning on being in the US, nothing that you do outside the US really counts, maybe it's just as a test market. Traction does count, like if you can show that, but, but you really have to be showing um, what you're going to be able to do there. Uh, I wouldn't discount it completely. Um, bridging the gap that's showing how you're going to penetrate the U.S. market. Um, I mean, and I see it all the time. I see people from different countries saying, oh, we're doing so great here, we're doing so great here, but it's a drop in the bucket. Now, again, things are changing. Sh things are shifting. Um, maybe it's better to find an investment that's local because if you're dealing with something that's local to Russia or to Eastern Europe or, to, you know, and you know that, then maybe they, they prefer to invest in the U.K., a lot of people just seek UK investors. Yeah, I have uh, uh, like very few more questions. Uh, first of all, there is one person who wants to pitch. Uh, oh, great. If anyone else uh, wants, please uh, get, let us know in the chat. Uh, one qu question from me. Uh, there will be uh, um, a pitching event uh, that is called Live Pitch to Go uh, Global Investors in uh, like five days. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, international investors and international founders connected from different countries. So what would be your recommendations for founders to pitch via Zoom, uh, Zoom environment? Okay, so um, first of all, if you, under my resources, same place as the ultimate guide to investor questions, I have an ultimate guide for the five minute pitch for the competition pitch. So go through that, it's the same structure as the investor pitch, just more condensed more story, more exciting. When you're on Zoom, um, you wanna look straight into the camera, you wanna use your hand gestures, you wanna smile, voice, make it very animated. Because when you're in person, there's things that can happen that are harder to, to establish. And I will talk in a minute uh, just about voice, so that was my next slide. Voice becomes essential when you're not there. So you can do a nice little exercise. Uh, you can record yourself talking in your regular voice and listen to yourself and see if you've fallen asleep. Then you can try doing an outrageous voice, crazy, like you were a home shopping network host. Listen to that. It might not be as over the top as you think. What seems like crazy to you might actually be very animated. And then you want to find the modulated voice in the middle. So that's going to help a lot. But one thing that's super important when English is not your first language is clarity. Okay? So you really want to take the time. One of the, the sounds that in, I know in Russian they don't do is the TH. So
So try putting the tip of your tongue between your teeth and saying this, that, the other, instead of zizadzeza, where my tongue doesn't come out. So it's not just Russians. I see it with Israelis and people who speak Arabic. There's a lot of different languages that don't have the TH German. So really practice. It's a, it's a, it's a muscle. So it's clarity is very, very important. They're not going to correct your grammar. And they're not going to say you made a mistake in English. They will, if they can't understand you, kind of tune out. Um, yes, any other questions? Yeah, there are more questions, but let's uh, probably let Yeah, I really want to, um, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, I want to hear from some people. So just, just to end off my piece, um, the quote that to me really talks about this time as a founder, um, Steve Jobs said, I'm convinced that about half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful one is pure perseverance. So keep on going. As long as you believe in this, you might get no's. Let that make you stronger and move your way towards success. And I'm here for you if you need work on any of these things to make you sound even better. So here's my website and email and LinkedIn. You're welcome to follow me. Um, and anybody that was in this webinar, mention it to me for a special discount if you reach out. Okay, I'm ready to hear from you. I uh, I actually offer doing this. I, I will use your contact details and a make a post in the community so uh, everyone Terrific. can use uh, uh, Thank you. your offer. Thank All you, right. that's great. Um, so, All right, so who's pitching? Uh, there is one question and there is one pitch. Uh, okay. Let, uh, let's give a question and uh, uh, the, other, the person who's gonna pitch, please prepare. Um, Vasily, please uh, ask your question. Vasily? Hi, guys. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, good, thanks. Um, Donna, Derek, and Daniel, first of all, I, I really would like to thank you for your time and sharing your life experience on uh, attracting investments and uh, all this cheerful stuff, as they say. And uh, my question would be, I just asked a question if you could uh, have uh, time and uh, possibility to have a look at our uh, pitch deck, which was sent to Harvard Business School for a competition annual, and uh, that's venture capital. So you wanna four. give us a little pitch now? Yeah, sure, I can send Okay, so but I think there was someone who was before you that asked so you can be second all right uh, i think it's the same guy oh is it no. yeah it's me is this maxim, who gogol. maxim gogol it's me. there with the question in uh here with uh pitch deck and um we did some uh i mean we have like 25 years experience on attracting finances for big huge companies in oil and gas and so forth and uh, only like four or five years, we started uh, doing uh, all this work on venture capital and Silicon Valley and uh, Anderson Horowitz and um, Sequoia and all the, all the jazz. Uh, quite interesting. Um, I really would like to go maybe like uh, or Stanford to, for PG or Harvard where I am an, an alumni. Uh, in uh, executive education and so forth. I also got the MBA in uh, Wyoming. You know all these places. Okay, places. so, uh, so can, sorry, just what's the question? The question is, would you please have a look at our pitch deck? Like I said, I will be happy to have you pitch after the person, Maxim, who said he's going to pitch, and that I will be giving you the look at your, at your pitch deck, okay? Yeah, okay, you very much uh, once again. Okay, great. Okay, Maxim. Uh, yeah, I'm connecting Maxim, just a second, let me find. Okay, now if you want, you can share slides, but what I really want to hear is not your whole deck, We're not, we don't have time for that. The problem solution story. That's where I'll be able to give you the most help, all right? Ma Maxim, so anybody that's gonna I'm pitch thinking. now, focus on the first two chunks. Maxim, uh, you can talk now, and uh, uh, I can give you. Yes. A uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Do you have Hi. Present? Uh, I have slides. I can show you. But Great. about uh, you problem can share solution. The screen. I think you have permission to share the screen. Yeah. Uh, the green button not, at the bottom. Yeah. Not yet. 
Yeah, I'm going to get the right, just a second. Uh, prepare your presentation, just give me a second. Uh, in the meantime, while uh, Daniel is setting it up, you want to tell us just in a few lines about your startup? Uh, so yes, my startup it is Mind Balance. Uh, I, I'm a sale of Mind Balance, and it is a mental health trainer for teenagers. So we uh, solve the problem of uh, the depression and different worries of teenagers. Mm -hmm. It is a, a mobile app with visual meditation mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how it chatbot and uh, speech reads. Okay, so pitch us. I'm waiting for share screen, or I can pitch without it. You can pitch without the slides too, if you, if you, if it, that's if it's too complicated. Okay. Uh, so uh, once hello. Uh, my oh, we lost you. Hello. Hello, Max. No, he's on mute. On mute. Okay, so Maxim, sorry. Start again, please. Yeah, you can share. I can share my screen now. Hello. Hi. Hello. There you are. Okay. Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, where is my pitch deck? Yeah, it's a beauty of uh, Zoom uh, connectivity when uh, you have small uh, pauses for five, 10 seconds. Why don't we, why don't we do this like, not do the slide, not do the slide. And, you can do this on and slides. I'm hearing the pitch one. Oh. Okay, no slides, just pitch us the problem and the solution and I will pitch you back, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, my name is uh, um, once more. Uh, my name is Maxim Gugliff and I'm CEO of Mind Balance, which is a mental health trainer for teenagers. So many of us uh, are aware of the mental health problem of adolescents, but uh, only a few of us know how big it is. And the number of depression and anxiety increased by 65% among young people over the last 10 years, and it is a, a really global problem because uh, teenage now, they are an adolescents in the future, and they are our uh, main, uh, I was about to say, main people in the world. <laughs> yes, and uh, we uh, find a solution. It is uh, uh, visual meditations. Uh, they are tested in uh, labs, and uh, they have um, um, effect on your brain, on the brains of the adolescents and uh, make uh, their neural connections such as uh, they don't have a depression or they have a low depression in the next years. Uh, so uh, we uh, make an MVP now and uh, if it is okay, if it, it is all about solution because I made always a short pitch each time, but I can uh, tell you more about our solution or about problem if it is necessary. Um, okay, so so good. I got it. So here's what I would do to make it a little bit more um, alive. Do you have a case of a specific teen that you can tell us? A story uh, of someone that his parents had no idea they were depressed? Uh, I have my own uh, story, but it is a little bit sad because my uh, cousin mm -hmm. uh, made a suicide, unfortunately, about uh, Two months ago, that's why I made this product. Uh, this uh, project. Yes. When you have a story that's a personal story, it resonates very powerfully. But I think it is. Uh, it is rather. There's depressed. a way to tell a sad and tragic story in a way that doesn't devastate. So here's how I would tell it. Um, I like the way you started. So it's adults. Depression rates are about say yay high, and we've seen it rising over the past several months since the start of COVID in an alarming way. But there's an even more alarming population that suffers from depression that don't even know how to give voice to that. And those are youth and teenagers. In the past five years, since smartphones have become so prevalent, we have seen more loneliness, more bullying, more anxiety happening with these populations. And personally for me, I was hit by this when my cousin, committed suicide two months ago. We had no idea he had been suffering from depression. And I wanted to find a way. And one thing we discovered, and this is where you have to link the problem to the solution is, um, they're so into screen times that their brains don't get any time for downtime and for relaxation. So I thought, well, if they're already addicted to their screens, why don't we give them a visual stimulation that will help them meditate, relax them, and bring them to a place of calming their anxiety. And that's why we've created 
So see, we did three things oh. there. We took, you know, the adult have it and we don't know it about kids. We connected it to your personal story, but then I'm missing why a visual meditation is going to solve depression. So you have to give me that little bit okay. of the connection. Okay. Uh, yes, Always, yes. everyone out there, if you have a personal uh, stake in this and you don't mind sharing it, it's very powerful. Mm. You don't have to go into the nitty gritty details, but it's very powerful because you have been affected personally and this drives your passion. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, do I have to uh, tell more about uh, science? Uh, Science possible. Yeah, of, definitely of, later you want to say so. This is backed by scientific studies of da 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 da, da mm -hmm. and give us that this really works. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, absolutely. But that'll be later in the business data and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the technology improving it. Great. Thank you. Thank you okay, so much. Who is next? Good luck with that. That sounds amazing. Um our friend that just we were talking to before that wanted was it Vasily that uh wanted to pitch? Um, and I can't look at your entire presentation, but, but, but we can definitely, Vasi, um, try to solve what's not working there. Or anybody else that would like to try? See, I don't bite. <laughs> uh, Daniel, you're, um, you're muted. Sorry, I muted you because we were hearing, um, Thank you. So, uh, anyone, please ask your questions. Use this opportunity to speak with Donna, or uh, if you have something to pitch uh, and get get feedback, please do it right now. You have this opportunity. Anyone else wants to pitch? Either it's too late and we're tired, or we're all shy. It's very scary <laughs> when when you want to pitch something. Uh, it's very scary <laughs> because <laughs> you gotta. But say hey, something. the Maxim did a great job, and and he got I some did. solid advice. Um, so, um, if nobody wants to ask questions uh, or pitch, uh, I think we uh, we'll wrap up. Um, we yeah, will have, oh. we will have the recording. There is one question about uh, uh, the recording. The recording will be uh, shared with everyone uh, in a couple of days. Great. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Thanks for staying up late. Um, and I want to wish you tons of luck with your ventures and with everything. And please let me know if I can be helpful. Yeah, so uh, before everyone go, I have a few announcements to make, um, but uh, I let uh, uh, Donna and Derek uh, uh, to uh, say final words and close this, and I'll make an announcements. Okay, thank you so much for having me. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, Donna, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, guys, good yeah. luck. Thank you very much, Donna. It was an amazing presentation. Derek, thank you so much as well. Uh, I'm going to have uh, a few uh, a few words about uh, our upcoming uh, webinars. Just let me share the screen. So uh, uh, I, I'm sure everyone uh, enjoyed this uh, as much as I did. Donna is a great uh, uh, presenter and uh, she shared a lot of valuable insights. I would like to say a few words about our uh, event tomorrow. We will talk about post-COVID due diligence. So join us to learn more about this with Brett and Catherine. Uh, they will be joining also from the United States. Uh, uh, on June 22nd, this month, they will have live pitch to global investors. Many American funds has joined us. And uh, if you would like to pitch them and you, will, uh, uh, you meet the criteria, we, may, we might let you pitch to them. Uh, and also, uh, we will have uh, uh, Steve Hoffman uh, speaking. Uh, he will uh, give you uh, his insights on how raising capital in the United States, Silicon Valley, and in China, which is very rare topic I hear everywhere. So uh, join also our community meeting on uh, um, in, in July uh, with uh, English speaking community and uh, specifically for Russian speaking audience, we also have a community meeting uh, end of June. So that would that would be a very interesting uh, networking meeting. Uh, this is the again. This is the QR codes to join our events. You can scan it. And uh, if you still didn't jo join the community, uh, it's very simple. Uh, um, I'll let you know in a second. So our partners: uh, Ruth Base, IB Consultants, Skolko Techno Park, GSD Venture Studios, and the Moscow School of Management Skolko. Uh, join the community by just following Go Global World on Facebook. 
uh, there you find your local country, just go in the groups of the community and find your local country, like go global Ukraine, go global Russia, go global United States, and uh, join uh, chats in there. And this is an example of local chats. Uh, join our Telegram uh, of Go Global Russia in English if you uh, want to be connected with Russian speaking uh, Russian community. We all speak English. Uh, we also on LinkedIn. This is the QR code, or you just can find Go Global World on LinkedIn. And uh, uh, this is the QR code to uh, Go Global World YouTube page, uh, where you can. Uh, find this video in a couple of days, uh, you'll be notified. So just subscribe to it and uh, you'll get notified. Don't forget to share it, like it. And uh, if you would like to discuss in the comments something, uh, you'll get the answer. Just uh, write comments below the video. So that's it uh, on my end. And uh, we're looking forward to see you on our next events. Thank you for coming. Derek, uh, thank you for inviting Donna. It was an amazing conversation. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed this a lot. If no more questions, uh, I am letting everyone go. Oh, uh, just one more question. Uh, uh, Derek, would you like to add a few more words uh, to the uh, people staying here? Wow, it's between me and going to sleep probably. Um, I just think there was, uh, Donna gave a lot of great things. A couple things I just wanted to emphasize was um, another reason that your pitch matters and stories matter is that investors are rating you and trying to determine if you are the invest if you are the entrepreneur that can raise multiple rounds of capital so investors are expecting you to raise three four five rounds of capital prior to a liquidation event so the story that they're looking for it needs to resonate with them but future rounds of capital that you're going to be going after. And I, I just think that that's really, really important. Um, the second thing is I'm more abrasive than Donna. So when it comes to testimonials, I have no sympathy for you. If you can't get testimonials, then you have a massive problem. Either get people to use it and give feedback, get experts to show evidence that they, uh, your idea is good, um, get people to validate that you're a good leader or a good executive, figure it out. Um, if you can't do that, I would really evaluate um, your idea. Um, the second thing is I see entrepreneurs every day that, that expect investors to put together how they are different. And you really have got to explain how you are different and with that differentiation, how that is an experience that's not one times better, two times better, but 10 times better than what is on the market today. And don't expect investors to connect those dots for you. Um, another thing regarding FOMO, someone asked a great question about fear of missing out. The way that you can focus on FOMO other than just that first presentation or in the pitch deck is to get send investors updates. It's like dating. Um, it's like meeting somebody to get married. That's what an investment is. In fact, investment relationships last longer in the U S than average marriages. So send them details about the traction that you're having. I would recommend on a monthly basis and show traction show that fire that is starting um that could be customer traction investment traction and really use that as a way to create fomo so if anyone has any questions a couple people wanted their decks reviewed i'm always available derek at gsdvs.com to look at decks and provide feedback so thank you all very much um, for staying till the end and for your time um, uh, Vitaly is asking, did you receive our pitch deck? Uh, so we will take a look uh, in our email box. So, uh, so you can email, email me and Derek. Uh, Derek, can you write your email as well? So you can me. Vasily, just uh, email your deck in there and uh, we'll follow with that. 
So I think that's it. Derek, thank you so much for your uh, uh, inputs. I think uh, uh, it's, it's very valuable and very relevant uh, to the topic. I appreciate everyone for the uh, time and uh, thanks for joining us. We will have more Eng uh, events in English uh, following as of today, uh, tomorrow, and uh, uh, a few days after. We will have uh, many great speakers. We will look, we'll look forward to seeing you there and uh, uh, you will get a lot of value. So thank you, have a good day, and see you soon. Goodbye.